Assalamu alaikum everybody. Welcome back to Shakespeare from the Islamic University of Gaza. This is uh, Rifat al -Ar We are working a little bit slowly on Hamlet because I want to give you the time to read more, to try to understand and analyze uh, the scenes and the issues we discussed, to do more research if you can. Uh, because this is a play that keeps giving. The more you read, uh, the more you understand, the more uh, you enjoy uh, the play. Today, we'll, uh, we'll do Act uh, 2, Scene 1, and half of Act 2, Scene uh, scene 2. Let me uh, share the screen with you first. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah, we do. Yes. Okay. In in scene uh, uh, one of Act Two, we go back to uh, Polonius's family, uh, his daughter Ophelia. We know he has a son who is now already uh, in France. You know, probably having fun, enjoying himself, uh, chasing after women. Uh, spending his father's money, learning French, whatever. But at that time it was, if your father is rich, you, you would spend a lot of your time in, in France, enjoying the wine, enjoying, uh, enjoying life and learning French, because uh, learning French was uh, a, a prestigious thing uh, to do. And we noted that the mother is silent. And I'm not sure, I haven't looked really carefully, maybe some of, some of you can look and do more research on this that uh, Polonius's wife, Philia's mother, is missing. Is she dead? Is she divorced? Did she run away? We don't know. But that will definitely have certain consequences because usually a boy goes to the dad. That's Spend typically it. conventional. And the daughter goes to the mom for, for help, for support, for a shoulder to cry on for an ear to listen. Now, in this scene, we have Polonius sending a spy to France. He, he's actually sending somebody, the name is not important, to give his son Laertes money. That's good. But at the same time, he's telling him, spy on, 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 uh, on my son. Like, see what he does. Uh, eavesdrop on his uh, conversations or dialogues and see what he does there exactly, and report back uh, to me. And when this interaction encounter ends, Ophelia rushes to the stage uh, very distraught. Too. Distraught in the sense that she is terrified, she's afraid, she is shaken. Why? She tells her father that she has a very strange encounter with Hamlet, who was behaving weirdly, in a strange way, he, who treated her, who kind of, I would say, harassed her. He touched her without consent, and he was kind of insulting uh, to her. We'll see this, and we'll see how, how it goes. Now, remember, usually in, in Shakespeare, he, he creates patterns. Patterns in the sense that, remember, we have for example, uh, a family, uh, Hamlet's uh, uh, family, his mother and his father-in-law. And then we move to another scene with another family. And usually we are invited to compare and contrast. The scene before this, we had Hamlet talk to his father's spirit, the ghost. While we saw some kind of connection, warmth between Hamlet and the father, there is no kind, there is no warmth at all here between Polonius and his son Laertes and Polonius and, and Ophelia. It's, it doesn't exist, this strong connection, spark that, that should exist in, in the family. But there's something that we need to notice. Hamlet speaks very little in the presence of his father. And Ophelia speaks very little in the presence of her father. So there, there's usually this father figure presented as an authoritarian. 
And that was the, the case uh, at that time. So if you think that some will accuse Ophelia of being weak, too submissive and too meek, but if you take this in the context of the Elizabethan age, you will understand that Ophelia was being obedient, was being good, a good daughter, because the, the, the rules, the conventions, the customs of that time dictated that she listens and obeys to her father and listens. Uh, uh, she obeys her father and listens uh, to him. Okay? Now, and this, this, is, this is developed here in this, in this slide. Uh, there is the contrast here between the warmth the love, I would say, but again, some of you might say, but that there could be a strong connection, but not maybe not love. If you love your son, you don't tell him, go kill, go take revenge, because that could hurt him. So there is a loving, loyal uh, relationship. And I like this comment here from your book that says it, the, 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 the relationship is so strong that it is capable of spanning the gulf between the living and the dead. Yani, even from behind the grave, from the dead, Hamlet's father comes to talk to him. Yes, he expresses, you know, some kind of uh, uh, anger and anguish and, you know, uh, asking for revenge, but still that shows something. But Polonius and Laertes have a relationship built on lies and built on spying and built, built on mistrust. And we should remember what Ophelia said to Laertes that, okay, you're going there, you are a womanizer, you're going there to, to, to have fun, to spend your father's money and to, you know, run after uh, uh, the woman. So again, some of you will say, but a father has the right to keep tab on his children. Perhaps, yes, think about this, but spying is, is an invasion of trust. Spying breaks this trust that should exist between uh, family members. To, to spy on one's own child certainly implies a relationship not at all founded on trust. If you love him, if you care about him, talk to him, reach out to him personally. But this tells us a lot about Le uh, uh, Polonius himself. Polonius is a man who likes to be in control. He is a man who likes to control every aspect of his kids, his children's lives. Maybe more uh, in control of more in control of Ophelia, Ophelia's life than of Laertes's, because Laertes was given money, was allowed to travel go to France, do anything. And this is the double standard, you know, in the society. The, the, the anti-feminism in the society. Kids were given all the chances, everything to do whatever they wanted. But the girls were deprived of their right to be human, being, human beings, to feel, to love. She, for God's sakes, was ordered, commanded to stop loving Hamlet. And that is the toughest thing anybody can, can do to stop uh, loving somebody, like to, to try to control your hearts and emotions against your desire. So control or the illusion of it. Yani, al-saytara or wahm saytara is of paramount importance to Polonius. He likes to know more, to spy, to eavesdrop, to control, to interfere, to poke his nose, you know, fishery. So Polonius's sense of control is based on his ability to eavesdrop. Sometimes he is gossipy, you know, he, 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 he uses gossip, he spies, he sends people, he, he pretends to be an old fool, an old man. But he's always collecting data and information. And we'll see what he does here. He does the worst thing a father can possibly do to his uh, uh, children. Not only interfere in his daughter's lives, uh, his uh, sons and daughter's lives, but also to use them, especially Ophelia, to use Ophelia to achieve his purposes. That's why he seems to be unaware because he is, in the book, he's described as a self-important man. 
He's full of himself. He's self-enclosed. He sees only himself. He only wants to be good in front of the king. He wants to serve the king, to help the king, even if this destroys his family and his daughter. So he seems to be unaware, oblivious, that uh, intrusion into, the, into other people's lives could be disastrous. Intrusion, you know, التدخل, تطفل. being curious, one thing, you know, could be disastrous. And the middling, middle, not middle with I in the middle. Middling is somebody middling to be in between. Will eventually have deadly consequences for his entire family. We'll see how that develops. So uh, before we go, continue, I want to give you two minutes to go through this. This is the first enc encounter when she comes on the stage, she says something, and this dialogue uh, goes on between her father, Ophelia, and her father. So take two minutes, scan it very quickly, and tell me what words you find, what expressions you find interesting or intriguing. Take your time. Two minutes. Okay, somebody. What words or expressions do you find interesting? Yes, doctor. Uh, she read the word, my lord. Okay, thank you. Next, Amal. Very good. Maybe it shows some respect. Wait, wait, Ahmed. Amal. Um, I love the way she was expressing, and she used the word, the, 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 the description when she was describing him. She described him as pale and his knees was knocking okay, as so, a sign. Okay, okay. so you, the description of Hamlet. Good. Nermeen. I'm also, the, the way he said that pale as his shirt. I like this very much. Okay, the, the physical description of Hamlet. Yeah horrible status Ari. very very amazing things when she said uh, as if he had been lost out of hell lost out out of hell interesting as... so you like the expression the language itself yeah no he used exclamation mark and question mark twice and he also used semicolon and comma more than one time so you're, you're looking at the punctuations. Don't give too much of your thinking to punctuation here. But yeah, they could be related to what message there could be. What else do you find interesting, yep. Farah? Um, well, Bolan is, um used the tough language with his daughter. Like she said that he's, uh, she is affrighted and he said in the, name, in the name of God. Like when a father talked to his daughter, she says, he's afraid, he hugged her, he hugged her like, and comfort oh, okay. him, not in okay, the game of God. So, okay, you find his reaction unfatherly, unfatherly horrible. In the name of God, with yes. what? What happened? But Can I add? It's possible because we could ask people, I'm afraid, what's going on? But later on, you could do the hugging after you know what happened, why I'm she like, is. Uh, I read frightened. it like, what, what in the name of God? Like he's uh, screaming on her, maybe? May possible. Mm -hmm. You could, if you if you are a producer, Farah, you could, if you want to make 
Polonia sound a little bit more evil. You could tell that the actor when you uh, hear this, uh, be a little bit angry. So you give an impression that you're not a, a soft hearted kind. Peter, of can, can I Asma. add? Asma. No, Asma, Reem. Uh, yeah, um, this whole extract is seen as only one sentence. It is, yeah. Because there's okay, that's uh, so one full stop. Interesting. I, fi I, li I find this very interesting. Oh, I didn't say I didn't see this myself. I, I think this is part of. Remember, we've seen we said we saw we said that uh, usually Ophelia speaks very little in the presence of her father. So this is the first time he is interesting, interested in what she has to say. So she is taking her time explaining herself. She doesn't exactly say, Hamlet attacked me. Hamlet frightened me. She wants to speak. This is a daughter who is repressed, who is suppressed. She wants to speak. She wants somebody to listen to her, a friend, a parent. And with the absence of her mother, she only has this horrible, horrible man for a father. But what I find interesting, what you said, all of you, really cool, is what she did. Look at the description. She's presenting herself as the dutiful, kind, submissive daughter that she should be, that she promised to be. As I was sewing in my closet, my closet, my own private room, and I was sewing like what daughters should be doing, what ladies, what women should be doing at that time. Presenting herself as the, the submissive, obedient daughter she is. She, she, she listens to her father's commands. She's obeying him. Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all unbraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, ungartered, and down, jive to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees, knocking each other, and with a look so piteous in purport as if he had been loosed out of hell, as if he has just been released or set free from hell. كأنه خرج للتو من الجحيم. To speak of horrors, he comes for me. He came to me, speaking of horrors. He terrified me. The way he speaks, the way he looks, and now, and this bizarre behavior from Hamlet. He raises many questions. We'll talk about this in detail. But the description here is that uh, uh, she's clearly distressed, distraught, frightened. Because this encounter in, in her own private place, Hamlet is invading. So it's not only Laertes and her father. So the three male characters in her life are invading her privacy, are trying to control her, to frighten her, to change her, to dominate her. She was alone, sewing, when Hamlet entered this heavel, distracted, pale and shaken, stuttering. He grabbed her wrist, stared at her face, and sighed deeply, as if loosed out of hell. Then, without ever saying a word, still looking at her, Hamlet left. Now, we'll go back to the question. Again, please don't answer until I tell you to do so. What do you expect? Farah already said something about, you know, the expectations. Oh, when your daughter comes to you, says, I am fright, affrighted, you don't just, with what in the name of God? You, especially, uh, it was Ahmed who said, she keeps saying, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. She, she, see, she likes him. She loves her dad very much. But he's not using the same uh, kindness to talk to her. So yeah, what do you expect her father? Now she tells him what exactly happened. And this is really terrifying. Yes. Raise your hand if you want to expect. If you didn't, if you didn't read, if you don't look, look if you didn't look at the book. What do you expect? What do you expect a good father to do here? And what would Polonius do? Remember, can somebody remind us what he did when, when Ophelia said that uh, Hamlet expressed genuine love to her? You remember the first thing they spoke of Hamlet? 
Remember what the father he said? Makes, uh, he makes unnecessary uh, afflictions for him. Like, poof, poof, affection, yeah? Poof, affection. He made fun of her. He mocked her. So is he going to change? Or is he going to be the same uh, a man with a heart of stone? So a father, like Farah suggested, would hug her, would ask her questions, would try to understand, to try to calm her down, and try to do something to prevent Hamlet from doing this, frightening her, his, his daughter again. What does he do? Can you expect? Can you guess, somebody? Mm -hmm. Maybe he go. Uh, he he could go to Hamlet and warn him to stop okay. frightening her. I'm not asking what would a good father do. What would what do you expect? Now we know something about Polonius's character. What would he do? This man. Voila. I'm not I'm not really sure. However, I think he might like um, mock her or just make fun of the situation. So like he, maybe he just will be the same man we already know. Exactly. He yeah. He will. I don't know. Okay. Read. Maybe he will. He he will just ask her, "What the hell did you say? Or what the hell did you do when, oh, when you okay. saw him?" Oh, interesting. I find this really good. So trying to blame her for what happens to her, and we have this in the society. In in, in, in an anti-feminist society, we usually have this: the daughter, the 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 the, the women, the girls, the ladies, the, the uh, they are always blamed for what happens to them, even if they are the victims. We are very quick to, 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 to stab the victims, to blame the victims, which is a horrible thing to do. Farah? Um, I think that he maybe um, he is shocked about what she said. So he maybe keep silence. And after that, he will like spy at her and Hamlet, like to know what is going on exactly. So he yeah. could spy on them, feel, express some kind of anger, but do nothing to her or to Hamlet. Okay. Ahmad? Uh, yes, maybe he assures her with uh, some words or uh, give her some Muslims from her uh, experiences in life. Okay, because he did, thank you. you. You're trying to compare what he did to his son. He gave him a lot of wisdom. When he departed to France, he said, neither a lender nor a borrower, remember? So he could be, he could do the same. But sadly, no. I think this is the worst reaction a father could have in such a, in such a situation. Mad for thy love? Is this because he loves you? Mad for thy love? A horrible, horrible, horrible reaction from a father to his daughter. Especially one that is genuinely shaken. Attacked, harassed by another man. No father should be doing this. No, should, no father should take light of what his daughter is going through. So interestingly, this is a strange father, a father that is not what fathers should be. Caring, loving, comforting. And then my lord, remember, this, it, she's typical, she's a typical Elizabethan uh, woman. I don't know, but truly I do fear it. So she's insisting that there is fear here, there's terror here. What said he? Again, this, it's like it's upside down. He's collecting information, so he keeps her talking. He lets her talk. And she finds the opportunity to reveal her inner thoughts to him. He took me by the rest and held me hard. Then goes he to the length of all his arm with his other hand, thus o'er his eyebrow. He falls to such perusal of my face, he keeps gazing and gazing at my face, looking into my face, as he would draw it as if he wants to draw, to, to memorize, to understand, to see everything. Long stead, he saw, he kept just no words, nothing. He just held me very hard, put his 
his arm on his, above his eyebrow and he gazed and gazed into my own face as if he would draw it. At last, a little shaking of my arm, I, I repelled him and thrice his head, or he it should, could, could be here, it could be Hamlet doing the shaking, and thrice his head thus waving up and down, he raised a sigh so piteous and profound. <sighs> piteous and he pities him. This is from someone who really fears Hamlet, but at the same time, who cares for Hamlet, who loves Hamlet. She's pitying him. But this could be because she's naive, because no woman should allow a man to do this to her, that it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. That done, he lets me go. No words are uttered. And with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes, like he keep, probably he kept looking at hair and he found his way just by groping around the area. For out of the doors he went without their help, without the help of his eyes. And to the last bended the light on me. And that's it. No words, no communication, no reaching out. He, he doesn't speak, she doesn't try to speak back. She just describes this horrible encounter and again there's a big question here is hamlet really in love with ophelia why is hamlet behaving like this remember the last time we met hamlet he promised marcellus and horatio to put an antic disposition to pretend to be mad to pretend so he can catch the king so he can you know trap the king and if he does love her, I want you to think of all these questions because we'll come to them later on also. Why is he mistreating Ophelia? The first time we see him <laughs> after <laughs> the, the, the encounter. <laughs> the, after the encounter between Hamlet and, uh, and, and the ghost, we have Hamlet mistreating Ophelia, not the king. Not his uncle. Not uh, anybody else. Answered? It's only Ophelia. No, I want to think of this because we'll come back to them in in the next uh, in the next scene. But I want you to talk about this very briefly. If you want to judge if somebody is insane or not, how can you tell if someone is like medically insane? How can you tell? How if you if you deal with somebody, if you look at somebody, can you tell if he or she is insane? And what 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 gives them away? Amal. Very briefly. I think their appearance or their action. Okay, excellent. Their appearance, that's number one. The way they look, dirty, misheveled, you know, tattered, torn, ragged. Number two, Dina. By his behavior. Thank you very much. His or her actions, the way they act. Riwa. Actually, Amal? you said what I wanted to say. Okay, Amal. Reem. Uh, there would be no correct complete phrases of okay, speaking. Okay, excellent. So the way they look, the way they behave, the way they speak, the language. What kind of language do they, do they speak? Grammatically correct sentences, complete sentences or fragments? Are the ideas uh, sensical or nonsensical? Do they make sense when they speak? Farah? A reason, for example, like they passed um, something that happened to them, make them shocked or insane. Or if, like, let's assume that we don't know. But with the case of Hamlet, if we want to apply these to Hamlet, something happened to Hamlet. Not something. Many things happened to Hamlet. Right. Mar Mariam? According to the way he, uh, he speaks, also the, uh, the voice tone that he may speak loudly. Okay, so it's not what they say, it's also the way they speak. 
And I want you to Google when you finish this class, if you have time, Google, how can you tell if somebody is like scientifically, medically insane? Like legally insane. And try to compare to link between these issues and Hamlet. Now I find the fact that Hamlet did not speak to Ophelia very interesting. Because you could deceive somebody by your appearance, right? You could deceive somebody by the way you behave, but maybe you can't deceive somebody who is very close to you, like Ophelia, by the way you, you speak. Because one major question, there are like many major questions in, the, in, the, in Hamlet. Number one, is Hamlet really insane? Or is he pretending to be insane? Is he feigning madness? The other question is, why is Hamlet delaying killing the king? If the king, if, if the ghost told you uh, the king killed me, killed your father, why don't you go directly and kill, kill the king? We'll talk about this later on. So I want you to also think of this question. Is Hamlet really insane or is he feigning madness? Is he pretending to be mad? So do these madness uh, issues, criteria, features, the way that people speak and behave and etc. do they apply to Hamlet? Or is Hamlet trying to uh, to be to look insane, to uh, uh, to deceive people into thinking he is insane? Look at this: the way Hamlet treats Ophelia makes him like a caricature of the Elizabethan melancholy lover. If you remember uh, uh, the poems uh, Petrarch and uh, Whoso List to Hunt and Come Live with with Me, My Love, a little bit. It's usually the, the lover is, you know, the abject, poor, melancholic. Oh, please love me back. He's disheveled. He's pale. His behavior is bizarre, strange. But we don't forget that Hamlet promised to put an antic disposition. Antic disposition means... Pretending to be mad, feigning madness, feigning madness. But when somebody tells you they are feigning madness, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are feigning madness. Maybe he is. So here, maybe he is genuinely mad. Did somebody, was it Farah, Farah suggested that we look into the history of this person. Did something happen to him, shock him in a, in a way to make him go insane, go crazy? Sadly, Sadly, he doesn't speak to Ophelia in this scene, and she doesn't speak uh, to him, which limits our ability to understand and to understand, to interpret its meaning uh, precisely. Now, look at this. There are two possibilities here. Hamlet's father died. Hamlet's loving mother, untimely, is uh, uh, remarried. He married very quickly. He married the man Hamlet dislikes. Hamlet lost the chance to be the king. And soon after, everybody is celebrating. Hamlet was let down by, by, by many people. And a ghost came from the dead, telling Hamlet, I'm thy father's spirit. And the ghost told Hamlet to kill the king to take revenge. Oh, my God. That would drive somebody crazy. That would drive somebody crazy. However, so many people say, yeah, he is crazy. At least, you know, momentarily. However, some say, no, Hamlet is not, is pretending to be crazy. And he, if he is used, is, it's better to say that Hamlet is crazy than to say he's pretending, he's planning, there's a plan, he's plotting something. Because if he's, plan, he's, he's pretending uh, to be uh, mad, it means he is using Ophelia. He is using Ophelia. The first thing he does, he goes to Ophelia, he pretends to be mad. Ophelia reports to her father, her father reports to Claudius. So what did he do to Ophelia? Again, some people would say, she deserves this because she rejected him. She repelled his letters. She sent the letters back, the presents, the gifts, everything. That does not still justify 
Hamlet using here. If a woman says no to a man, no is no. No means no. So like uh, Polonius using Ophelia, Hamlet is also using Ophelia. The woman is always the victim. So if interpreted, <coughs> if, ha if Hamlet is feigning madness, it means Hamlet is using Ophelia as a pawn. You know, pawn Hajar Shataran Jundi in his game of cat and mouse with the king. If he feigns madness, surely she will report to, the, to Polonius, who will then tell the king and the queen. As Hamlet indicated at the end of Act 1, he wants to create an impression that he is not as stable. Why is he doing this? So the king can trust him. Because many people will say, why did Hamlet go and kill the king? Number one, this is not this, this is the king. This is not an easy thing to do. And this, Hamlet is not a soldier. He's a prince, but he's not a soldier. He's not a murderer. He's a man of letters. But don't forget, a king is usually heavily guarded, protected. Especially a king who just killed a king, who knows that Hamlet could be after him. We've seen Hamlet, the verbal war that Hamlet waged. So Hamlet wants to give the king the impression that Hamlet is not stable, he's insane in order for him to let his, guard, his guards down, to trust Hamlet more, to stop suspecting Hamlet. That's a very interesting bit. Look at how the play is getting you know, deeper and, uh, and, and deeper. So this is uh, the thing about Hamlet going insane, the loss of the, his father, the crown, the loss of Ophelia. He wants somebody to talk to. I, I, I'm sure he felt, I'm sure, he felt betrayed by Ophelia for avoiding him, for repelling his letters, for sending them back unopened, for rejecting him. There is great disappointment. There is great disillusionment. Disillusionment that could lead sane people to act insanely. And now, like, thank you very much. Some of you suggested already that Polonius will instantly use the news like Hamlet also expected and run to the king. I'll come, go with me. And it, he, now he wants, to do, wants her to be with him. Now he trusts her. Now, you know, but only so he could, you know, satisfy his ego. So she could help him become, appear to be the good man he is in front of the king. I'll go seek the king. No, and then she says, no, my good Lord, but you did. Uh, when he tells, uh, 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 have you given him any hard words of late? Did you communicate with him? Did you give him any promise or something? She said, no, as you did command, I did repel. Look at the repel from repulsive. Repel, reject his letters and denied his access to me like you commanded me. I am a dutiful, submissive meek daughter, obedient daughter. And in the book, I think this could be something. In the book, it says here that Polonius a little bit feels like a father. He feels sorry for his daughter. And maybe he feels sorry for Hamlet because he remembers when he was young, when he was rejected from a woman, he felt sad. But does he act on this? Does he stop being a horrible father? Does he try to protect his daughter? No. What he cares about is one thing. Satisfying the king, pleasing the king. Even if this is at the, the expense of his daughter and his family. So that has made him mad. So he, he, he kind of you know, like admits that maybe he is mad because he's in love with you, because you stopped loving him. I'm sorry that with better heed and judgment, I had not quoted him. I'm sorry I misinterpreted uh, his relationship. I thought he is tricking you. And now I am convinced that he is mad because you're rejecting him. I feared he did but trifle and meant to whack thee. But beshrew my jealousy by heaven, it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. I'm an old man, I want to protect you. But again, he doesn't do anything to protect his daughter. Go, come, go we to the king. 
this must be known, which being kept close might move. Mere grief to hide than hate to utter love. I like how Shakespeare doesn't give him uh, a couplet like he usually does at the end of the scene. So the scene ends, and then before we move to, uh, I just give some commentary and uh, see if somebody wants to say something. But just after this. So Shall I? The, the, uh, what happens here is that uh, there is a dangerous assumption made by Polonius. Okay. First, he doubted Hamlet as a lover. He thought that he is using, uh, he will pretend to be in love with uh, what's his uh, Ophelia, and then when he becomes the king, he will leave her. He is not seriously in love with her. Okay. But when she, uh, uh, when Polonius asked Ophelia if she has been talking to Hamlet, she says, No, you commanded me to stop, and I stopped. So Polonius here declares Hamlet mad because of how Ophelia rejected him, because of Ophelia's rejection. A little bit here, he regrets his hasty judgment when he, remember in, C, in Act 1, when he told her, don't love him, he doesn't love you genuinely, he pretends to, be, to love you. Polonius has realized that he was wrong about Hamlet. The prince was not merely toying with Ophelia's affections. To his credit, Polonius seems genuinely sorry for his interference in lines 114, 117, and it reveals just for this tiny little bit that this man can be a good father, that he has what it makes a good father. But this fatherhood doesn't appear again because there is something more important than his daughter, than his family, pleasing the king, spying for the king, eavesdropping for the king in the need to feel important he decides to bring this news immediately to the king i want you to keep uh, uh, thinking of this question what do you think of Poli polonius's treatment of his daughter examine the encounters how many times they were together and what they talked about how did he treat her first sometimes not seriously sometimes seriously but when he treated her seriously did he help? Was he there to support? Or what did he do? Okay, Nermin, very briefly, what do you have to say? No, I want to say that uh, if Hamlet pretending that he is a mad, this is remind me about something by, written by Shakespeare uh, about King Lear. Do you remember that the, the, uh, the Tom, the madness of Tom, he's uh, he is Edgar, the, the son of uh, uh, early Gloucester. He's pretending that he is mad because he he want to to convince his father. He tell that the truth. His his brother uh, Edward is not a good son. He want to kill him to be a king. I think uh, Hamlet here pretending he want, he he's a mad, but he's not. Okay. He want to do something in the end. I okay. That's very, thank you for linking one play to the other, but I want you yeah. to try uh, to wait a little bit. It's, I don't want anybody to say Hamlet is mad and to insist on the same opinion as the play goes on and on. It's okay to change your opinion as we go into the acts and the scenes, and this is the nature of Shakespeare. Okay, so next, briefly, Mar Mariam. Okay, I think it's interesting that till now we don't have a real, uh, like, real conversation or real acting between Hamlet and Ophelia. Yeah, uh, sure. We have just Ophelia reporting uh, what happens to her. So I think just, that's it. Uh, true, that's, that's interesting. And, and this could be in part because of what I just said. Uh, if you can be deceived by somebody's actions and you know, their appearance. Maybe you can't be deceived by the way they speak. And that's why Hamlet chose not to speak to her. Maybe he was too... Listen, we don't... I'm not claiming that Hamlet is 100% pretending. He is... Hamlet is a, is, a, is a kind man. He's a poet. He's a kind man. He's a good man. He's a good young man. So he must be hurt that Ophelia is rejecting him and repelling his letters. 
He must be suffering. He must be in pain. He must be in excruciating pain. He must be tortured that she's rejecting him for no reason. So yeah, this could be some Hamlet being Hamlet, being sad, being, you know, unable to, to speak, to express himself because he is betrayed. At the time, remember, many people say, I could forget when I am in pain, when I am suffering, when I am low, I could forget my enemies because they are my enemies. But I will never forget my friends who did not stand by me, who did not support me. So here, Hamlet lost his father, lost his mother. And now he loses the one person he loves, he truly loves. And in my opinion, the way he deals with her is, is rejected, shouldn't be. But also, it tells how genuinely he loves he loves her. I know many of you want, want to, to talk about this, but we'll come back to this point later on. So keep thinking about, about this. Now, act two, scene two, this is the longest act in Hamlet. It's like six, 600 lines. We're not going to do it all. We're going to do a part of it. So what happens here? The king and the queen invite Hamlet's childhood friends, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, two interesting names. And I'm going to say Zingu Ringu, you know, Pat and Matt. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They are Hamlet's childhood friends. Because they want, again, the king, maybe the king doesn't trust Polonius 100%. He wants more eyes and more ears to spy for him. And this is what kings and governments do all the time. The Danish ambassadors, remember the ambassadors sent in Act 1, Scene 2, come and tell him that Fortinbras, the nephew of the king of Norway, will not invade Denmark, so don't worry. And then Polonius tells the king and the queen about Ophelia's rejection and how it caused Hamlet's madness, transformation, change. And he says the plan, the best plan is to eavesdrop Hamlet and Ophelia. Look at him, he's using his daughter even more. If you hated Polonius for what he did, wait and see what he's going to do later on. Now, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern begin their efforts on behalf of the king to try to spy, to try to get more information from Hamlet. Hamlet temporarily forgets his melancholy, his madness, his antic disposition when a group of actors arrives in Elisinor in Denmark. His life comes back to him because Hamlet is a dramatist. He's, he's a poet. He loves drama. He loves the stage. So when the actors come, he has another plan and it brings, breathes life into him. Hamlet plans to use the play to prove the king's uh, guilt. So, uh, uh, again, I love Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. I love these two characters. They're very comic, very interesting. And the funny thing about them is that we keep, everybody keeps uh, mistaking them for one another. So here, after they agree, you know, uh, and they are promised money by the queen, the king says, thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Gild uh, Guildenstern. And the queen says, thanks, Guildenstern and gentle Rosencrantz. <laughs> I don't know why they mix up. Uh, some might say, say that the queen is trying to be different. She's imitating. But the interesting thing here is that those two people are too colorless. They are too dumb that they are like twins, similar in the way they are, in their stupidity. That you can't tell which is which. So the king thinks that this man is Rosencrantz and this man is Guildenstern. But the queen thinks, no, this man is Gild uh, Rosencrantz and that man is Guildenstern. Just this tiny piece of information about these uh, two gentle, uh, gentlemen. And ah, oh, look at this. And I, I honestly, I read this line. Remember, in Shakespeare, especially in Hamlet, every time you read, you find something new. Every time you read, you, you find something new. 
I was reading this article about Polonius, and in the article, the author said, Polonius, the father of good news. And I thought that the author was just being funny and he's, use, he's making up this expression. I didn't think that this is from Hamlet, from, by Shakespeare, from the play. So when Polonius comes to the stage, the first thing the king says is, thou still has been the father of good news. Abu al-Akhbar al-Jayyida, Abu al-Akhbar al-Sarra, Abu al-Akhbar al-Mufriha. And this again makes uh, Polonius proud. And the king, that, this is, the king doesn't mean he, he killed the king. It doesn't mean he's stupid. He's, he's cunning. He's subtle. And the way he won Gertrude, the way he won, he managed to kill the king. The way he managed to be chosen, elected king, shows that he's a subtle man. The way he's doing politi politics and diplomacy with Norway, sending ambassadors. Again, everything shows the way he's using Polonius. He's using Guldenstern and Rosenkrantz, or Rosenkrantz and Guldenstern. Is that he's a, he's a cunning man. So he knows what Polonius wants. He, Polonius wants praise, wants to, be, wants to be praised by the king. And the king says, the father of good news. Have I, my lord? Have I, my lord? Assure you, my good liege, and I hold my duty quickly. He's again. Uh, 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 you know, telling him, I'm all yours. I hold my soul both to my God and to my gracious king. And necessarily he would give his family away. And I do think, or else, this man doesn't say things directly. He keeps rambling and ranting and talking and talking. He doesn't say things, he keeps going on and on and on. Or else, this brain of mine hunts not to trail of policy so sure as it hath used to do. That, my lord, I have found the cause of Hamlet's lunacy. When the queen talks about Hamlet, she uses the word change. Hamlet is changed. The king uses a bigger word. Transformation. Transformation. Not just change. But Polonius uses the strongest word possible. Lunacy. Craziness. Madness. I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. I know why Hamlet is behaving. This. Oh, speak of that. That do I long to hear. Please tell me. He doesn't. He says, okay, okay. Like, look, he's creating drama and suspense. He wants to be the center of attention. All he cares about is self-importance. He wants people to listen to him. Even the king and the queen. And he says, before we, I tell you the, 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 the cause, let's listen to the two ambassadors. The ambassadors who were sent to Fortinbras's uncle to stop uh, the war. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this uh, quotation. One of the most famous quotes in all of Shakespeare and in Hamlet is this, the uh, uh, line 90. Brevity is the soul of wit. Can somebody translate this? Brevity is the soul of wit. How would you translate this? What's brevity? الإيجاز. Yeah, brevity from brief. مش إحنا في نهاية الparagraph واللي سيف لكتبه in brief. Brevity is the soul of it. الإيجاز. هو روح الدهاء. هو هو روح الدهاء. مش بس الدكاء. الفطمة. يعني سر الفطمة في الإيجاز. أو خلينا نقول. خير الكلام ما قل ودل. خير الكلام ما قل ودل. Excellent. But look at this. Who is saying this, Polonius? Considered to be the most talkative character in Hamlet. But of course, Hamlet speaks much more, much more, but Hamlet is the main character. So, Polonius, 
الخطبه احيانا بتصير and this is very provocative if you say privity is the soul of wit get to the point but he keeps ranting ranting and going on and rambling and rambling so and look at what he says he says nothing empty he just wants the king and the queen to focus to pay attention to him this business is well ended don't worry i know the reason my liege my liege like my my lord my madam to expostulate what majesty should be what duty is what day why day is day night night and time is time we are nothing but to waste night day and time therefore since brevity is the soul of wit and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes i will be brief but again he isn't brief your noble son is mad allah atik al afi shukran barak allah fi as he say he uses lunacy and now he uses mad mad call i it for to define true madness okay but you are in junoon to define true madness what is it but to be nothing else but mad ايش بالشعر العربي بيقول بعد طول جهد وعناء فسر الماء بالماء اي وان ثانك يو عمل mad call i it for to define true madness what is it but to be nothing else but mad فهو نفسه بيقول i find this really interesting but let that go يعني he realized that <laughs> He's repeating himself. He's using the same uh, expression that he has no point, no idea. But let that go. Can we go? Yeah, half one, half one. And I love what the queen says. Not the king. The king is like being trying to be patient. You know, he wants the information. He wants Polonius's trust. He wants to use Polonius. More matter with less art. Yeah, and what's the matter? More matter, less art. Stop trying to be to you know. use big words and redundancy and wordiness more matter less art get to the point so is polonius the clown it's not it's too early to judge but he pretends he makes a clown of himself he uses his family polonius tells the king that ha- why hamlet is mad in in a long winded even uh, uh, polonius is long why why did even as he declares that it is best to be brief he's contradicting himself he says i will i will be brief but he doesn't uh, 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 speak uh, uh, briefly here the royal kabil barely tolerates his rambling explanation the queen says more matterless art that's why shakespeare presents him makes fun of him mocks him because he mocks his daughter he makes people laugh at him Gertrude prefers that he gets to the point that he get to the point here Polonius however feels excessively self important and he well, he uh, will draw out of at his explanations as long as he can he will extend and stretch as long as as he can and then the worst thing a father can possibly do if remember one he mocked Ophelia and we hated that about him and then he used ophelia's pain and we abhorred that about him and now he says look at line 106 he wants to use ophelia to no more to spy on hamlet and we detest him for this a father should not be doing this he's using his daughter as a guinea pig as a rat as as bait كان هطوم even the expression he uses shows how horrible he is i have a daughter have what run i get look at how he keeps repeating himself i have a daughter have while she is mine if you if he's your daughter daughter yes he is yours why you you keep saying this he talks about ophelia sorry this is the expression i want to to say to use where is it where is it refat yes here 163 i will lose my daughter to him I will lose. Remember, Ophelia used the word "lose," loosed out of heaven, of hell. With the atlig al binitai, I will use her as if she's an animal, as if she is, I don't know, a rat, bait, tom, an insect that would 
help them catch him. Horrible, horrible. Horrible. The worst thing a father could do is, is everything here. Everything this man is doing to his daughter. But there is yet more. Can you be a more horrible father than Polonius? Yes. He invades his father, his daughter's privacy. Like he is invading Laertes, sending spies to France. He takes the letters that Hamlet sent. So in the letters are secrets. If Hamlet sends a letter to Ophelia, he only wants Ophelia to read it. If Ophelia receives the letter, she is the only person that should read this. Never invade people's privacy, even if they are your kids, your brothers, your sisters. And he reads one of the letters. A beautiful, again, heartbreaking letter, very poetic. It shows how genuinely in love Hamlet is. Oh, dear Ophelia, look at the words. Oh, I am ill at these numbers. I have not art to reckon my groans, but that I love thee best. Oh, most best. Believe it. Adieu. Thine evermore most but I want to read the the part uh, above before, which is very poetic. Many people quote this. Doubt thou the stars are fire. Doubt the sun doth moon. Doubt truth to be a liar. But never doubt I love. The, starting the letter with poetry. كان بقول يعني قد تكون قد لا تكون النجوم نار من من نار وقد لا تتحرك الشمس يعني كانوا يعني he's like comparing يعني uh, يعني he's using facts pure facts to say I love you as uh, uh, exactly like as long as the the stars are fire even if the stars are not fire, even if the sun doesn't move, even if truth is a liar, I still love you. Wow, that's exaggerated, that's hyperbolic. Again, look at the, oh dear Ophelia, I love thee, oh most best, thine evermore, al mukhlis laki, abadan, most dear lady, whilst this machine is to him, this heart is alive. Hamlet, oh, a horrible, horrible thing revealing his daughter's uh, correspondence with Hamlet. But all he cares about is the king telling him the father of good news, the father of good, of good news. Now the plan, what's the plan? I will lose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind the arras, then we'll hide behind the curtains and we'll bring Ophelia to him and see how he deals with her, how they interact. How remember, Hamlet has just attacked Ophelia, harassed her. He shouldn't be trusted around her, he shouldn't be allowed near her. But to please to satisfy the king, Polonius is willing to use his daughter abuse and exploit her. Mark the encounter if he love her not and be not from his uh, reason fallen theron. Yani, Let me be no assistant for the state. Yani, I'm sure he's mad because she is rejecting him. If I am wrong, just fire me. But keep a farm, Carter's king, we will try. The king says at the end, We'll try. And then finally, I'll stop at this. Just give me two minutes and I'll see what some of you want to say. We'll continue the scene next, next, last. Now, Hamlet, the king and the queen leave and uh, uh, Hamlet comes on the stage. And this is the first encounter between Hamlet and Polonius. And Hamlet savages him like he... Uh, 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 he he makes fun of him. He mocks him. He, he but at the same time he's he's pretending to be insane. 
and crazy. He, here he accuses him of being a fishmonger. Fishmonger at that time, fishmonger, somebody who deals with, sells fish. But it, it was also used at that time to mean somebody who uses his daughter, who sells it his can daughter be for, for, for people, like a pimp. And then Hamlet asks him, have you a daughter? Have you a daughter? Do you have a daughter? He says, I have, my lord. And then later on, when he keeps, you know, insulting him and mocking him and making fun of him, the, king, the Polonius does three asides in this part. How say you that still harping on my daughter? He keeps asking about my daughter, if I have a daughter. And I love this. Many people ask me, what's your favorite quote from Hamlet? And I say this. He says, because Hamlet was reading. What do you read, my lord? And he says, words, words, words. And this tells a lot about Hamlet and his character and his mentality. He's a man of words. He's a poet. He's a writer. He's a producer. He's a playwright. He's not a killer. He's a lover. Words, words, words. I love this quote from Hamlet. But uh, like somebody said, how he uses language in this, you know, fragmented way, not comprehensive, not coherent, not cohesive, fragments, incomplete sentences. And then I'll stop at this, and then we go uh, back to it probably next session. And Polonius says something because Hamlet keeps, you know, making fun of Polonius, going in, sometimes going insane, forgetting who this man is, but giving him words giving him things to attack him like fishmonger and uh, accusing Ophelia even of being a prostitute like he accused his mother earlier. So this is one, again, one of the famous lines that people usually quote. Polonia says, though this be madness, he insists that Hamlet is mad. Yet there is method in it. يعني هذا جنون, but there is method in it. يعني جنون عاقل خلينا نقول. جنون منظم زي ما نقول احنا الفوضى الخلاقة you know it's, 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 it's an oxymoron a paradoxical statement so yes I think he is mad but sometimes he says something that is you know wise something that touches me because he keeps asking about my daughter my daughter my daughter and finally Polonius seems to be the clown in Hamlet but we still haven't had everything about Polonius we'll, we'll see next uh, next session, more interaction between Hamlet and Polonius. So he seems to be the clown in this play, the jester. But his self-importance inflicts serious damage on almost all the characters, starting with his family, especially Ophelia. So yeah, okay, Ahmad, you want to say something briefly, and then Asil? Yes, Doctor. I want to say about the letter that uh, Hamlet sent to Ophelia. Is it real or not? Because uh, we have some seeing uh, Polonius uh, lying all the in all the play. Okay. And uh, he is using his door uh, also. Uh, so is it a I play don't... from Polonius? Ahmed, thank you very much. That's a very good point. Is this a genuine letter? We don't know. Uh, but uh, I don't think. Polonius didn't lie. Polonius, he was, he, I think he, he didn't, he didn't clearly understand uh, uh, Hamlet or his daughter. I, I don't think he was lying. He, 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 he wanted to lie. He just wants to please the king. So yeah, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps this is a, a letter from Hamlet. Or maybe not, but there is no indication that this is a letter written by Polonius because we know Hamlet sent many letters. Ophelia said this. So maybe yes, maybe no, but in my opinion, I think, yeah, this could be a letter from Hamlet. Asil? Yes, Doctor, I'd like to comment on uh, pretending madness. Uh, actually, someone as Hamlet, he's a hardworking, take the, um, to take the revenge I think he's not afraid uh, much to pretend to pretend madness. If I example pretend to 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 do something, actually, I'm planning to prevent something 
and I think both of them are uh, are hiding something. Uh, and actually, as you finished uh, the lecture, well, by uh, by resembling Bologna, uh by a clown, I think Bolognius is not stupid enough to to be clown. So both of them, um, both of them, uh, I think. That is, that uh, is possible, I, but again. Think of this madness issue and see. Let's see next scene and the next the scene after, and have a final judgment about Hamlet's sanity. I think Farah there is briefly. A relation. Farah okay. briefly. Ashan, uh, sorry, Asil. We have to be brief because I don't want to keep you late. Farah briefly. Okay. Um, I think that Shakespeare that the whole play starts with a big misunderstanding by Polonius, and ended with that. And that is what we do actually in our uh, life. We created a thing and invented. And then we believe it, and then we act depend on it, and then at the very beginning, at the at the end, we damage our bonds with okay. beautiful. Okay, interesting. Thing. So if you and if you if you do something and you don't fix it, you keep doing wrong things based on on that in the same error you committed, the same misjudgment. Right. Uh, Reem, that's want... it. Reem, no okay. Reem, because we don't have much time. I'll give just one minute okay. to each one. Reem. Thank you, Ova. Um, so I want to ask, how could we consider how could we consider Shakespeare as that feminist writing um, like more interestingly women characters? Well, until this point in the play, um, the the women characters we have like Gertrude, Hamlet's mother, is is portrayed okay. as a bad one, and Ophelia is is that naive to reject uh, uh, Hamlet's love to her. So. How women characters are considered more that's, good, that's, more better, better than the other place. Very beautiful question. Very good question, uh, uh, Reem. Uh, there are many things to say. We, we'll come to feminism and feminism later on. Number one, don't judge Shakespeare from one play. You need to take the totality of his literature and, you know, balance things. That's one. Number two, the, the, these weak women characters are not necessarily Shakespeare saying women should be like this. Maybe Shakespeare ex is exposing the society that is anti-feminist, that is misogynistic. Maybe Shakespeare is, is trying to provoke women not to be like this woman, not to be like that woman. And this is what I believe in, in, in uh, as a matter of fact. I think yes, Shakespeare yes. is trying to expose the society and in totality, we have other strong characters like Portia here, and there are two Portias in, in the Mansion of Venice. Uh, Lady Macbeth is a strong character. We'll see how Ophelia and Gertrude develop as female characters. Finally, voila. Yeah, I just wanted to say an, uh, another thing, but I want to comment on uh, what Tareem just said. So basically, when uh, uh, we voila, started... Voila, you have one thing to say. Either comment on, voila, on uh, what Tareem just said, or say the idea you want to say. Oh, okay. I'll say You're the other idea. Time. Okay, I'll say the other idea. Well, uh, I think uh, that uh, when um, um, Ophelia said that Hamlet took up his ha his hat, I think that foreshadows like how Hamlet is going to act differently. I mean, like during the Shakespearean time, they used to wear hats and stuff. And so, what I think is that it is foreshadowing that after this moment or after this scene, uh, Ham is not going to be noble. He's going to act uh, differently. Uh, okay, possible. So, if, if the hat is part of the head, yeah, like, just uh, like so the... he's changing his head. Possible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the, these are really, really good uh, ideas. Thank you, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Victor, uh, would you like to talk uh, about the quiz? I already told you what the quiz will be. The quiz will be 10 true or false statements from the introduction and act one. Get ready and uh, study well, watch the videos and you will be fine. When okay. the time, the time. I already posted the information, Yanermin. Uh, the information is already posted on Moodle and on your, uh, your group. Watch the videos, read the slides, the PowerPoint files, take notes. If you have questions tomorrow, today or tomorrow, ask me. And you have to do the quiz. If you don't do the quiz, you lose the mark. Okay. 
يعطيكم العافيه